The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. We stack them in a sort of a pyramid formation, and it gives a solid surface for that new oyster reef. Some of my daydreams had to do with tall, thin cowboys with big belt buckles. You know, it's now paying off where we have surplus populations where they're thriving. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. They can be flame grilled or fresh from the bay. <laughs> Folks love their oysters. But what to do with these oyster shells after dinner? Well, there's another place besides the trash. What we're doing is helping to return oyster shells back to the bay. Oyster shells are a very easy resource to recapture from the restaurants. So why not grab those shells and put them out in the bay? In Galveston, a hands-on oyster shell recycling program is underway. Tons and tons of old oyster shells are on their way to a new home. But to tell this tale, we need to back up a little bit. It's recycling day, and Tukey's Seafood is stop number one. If the restaurants buy in on it, and the restaurants then influence their staff to really be a part of it, it makes our job so much easier. Their servers, their busboys, their back of the house is taking all those shells, recycling them, putting them in the bins for us. So that way we can come by every week to collect the shells. We began oyster shell recycling in response to the damage to the oyster reefs in Galveston Bay after Hurricane Ike destroyed nearly 60% of the bay's reefs. So the Galveston Bay Foundation's mission is to return as many shells to the bay as possible to provide new oyster habitat. We then leave the shells out and they cure in the sun for six months. This pile here has been collected for about a year, so in a year's time, this is some of the shell we've collected. It's gonna sit here for a little bit longer uh, to be fully cured, and then we can actually go put it back on the bay, and that's ultimately the goal. You're taking it out of its natural environment to eat it, you might as well return what you can to the sea. I mean, if you wanna keep eating oysters in the future, it's a good idea. We get to come out here and rebuild reefs, do good work to help the environment. I don't know, it's really rewarding. Uh, now we've got these 30 pound bags that can then be floated out to our reef site and then used to build. We stack them in a sort of a pyramid formation and it gives a solid surface for that new oyster reef to begin to grow. We've already seen an, an abundance of oyster growth on these recycled shells, so it's definitely working. This guy here is pretty unique. You see on the tip here, that is a brand new baby oyster that's growing. You can really see the old shell here and the new oyster growth. While the increase in oysters is great, a year's worth of mud and muck means new marsh grasses can be planted. So this site in particular was seeing a lot of erosion. Our goal is to get that marsh back. The reefs have been in place for a couple years. We've got some of that sediment accumulated and we're gonna be planting smooth cord grass um, behind that reef, in between the reef and the shoreline to help establish that new marsh habitat. 
And while the reef restoration project will bring much needed habitat to this small stretch of Galveston Bay, the hope is to keep this recycling idea going to improve bays all along the Texas coast. And ultimately, these reefs provide that shoreline protection. Uh, we need that support, that buildup of oyster reefs on the bay bottom and along our shorelines uh, to better the bay as a whole. Deborah Clark and Emery Birdwell are moving cattle on their 14,000 acre ranch in North Texas. I never pictured living on a ranch. Now, I will tell you that some of my daydreams had to do with tall, thin cowboys with big bell buckles. And so I always tell people, be careful what you ask for, you may get it. Because I certainly got that in an Emory Birdwell. She's the personality, I, I won't say what I am, so. Raising cattle is how they make a living but their bigger goal is taking care of the land. A lot of people think it's just about the cattle. It's not. They are what makes it all go in the end, but it starts with the soil, and then it's the grass, and then it's the cattle. Deborah and Emery move 5,000 head of cattle every day to replicate the movement of the bison that once roamed these prairies. Native prairie is one of the most endangered ecosystems left in the country. By mimicking the way bison and other natural grazers graze the land, they have been able to improve the soil quality, increase the species diversity, their water quality is better, and they're also having a more productive ranch than it was under another system. The ranch produces twice the county average of beef per acre and in less time. What that says is that we have increased the carrying capacity here at the ranch due to the, the fact that there are more grasses and forbs. So that little blue stem's the same way? Where From a biologist's perspective, I see diversity. This is a little blue stem that's starting to really grow. If we've got more plant diversity, we've got more wildlife diversity, and that is because we can offer not only cover provided by our tall grasses, uh, but also food in the form of our forbs and a combination of all of those across the landscape can support everything from our, our ground nesting birds and big game, small game across the gamut. The ranch was the first thing that we ever really did together. Emery is an excellent grazer. He's a master at what he does out here on the range. But I say this to his face, he is not a very good teacher. And I had to try to find out what we were doing. And so I just became a workshop groupie. Hi, Mr. Goodwin, how are you, darling? I'm Deborah Clark. This is my husband, Emery Birdwell. I'd like to say she does all the talking and I just hang around. Deborah and Emery have been just incredibly generous. They design workshops, they speak at other people's workshops. This is an education that's incredibly valuable for other ranchers and also for the state of Texas. Deborah and Emery also give back to the local community, opening their ranch for Turkey Fest and hosting hunts for airmen from nearby Shepherd Air Force Base. This was a gift. It's our responsibility to share it. To have native grasslands going forward, we're going to have to restore them and that is going to be an effort that's going to fall on the shoulders of private landowners. When you're taking on a challenge like that, uh, it's, it, it can be very daunting. They show other landowners what is possible and that you can do amazing things. It's important to both of us that we are who we are and that we can convey to people what it means to be out here and to see the changes as a result of your hard work and to make that viable for them to dream as well.
before the sun rises, if you look off in the distance, you know, the mountains are, are silhouetted, almost as if they were just cut out. Uh, you begin to see all the details and all the defined lines and canyons, and it's real beauty, natural beauty. You know, there's, there's magic to this land. My name is Froland Hernandez, and I'm the Desert Bighorn Sheep Program Leader for Texas Parks and Wildlife. When I'm up at up on top of Elephant Mountain, uh, looking for the sheep, my first glimpse of them it's it's overwhelming. Even if it's just a single animal, that's really what makes my job, you know, very interesting. I love my job. Historically, the native Texas desert bighorn sheep occurred in about 16 mountain ranges out here in, in the Trans-Pecos, mainly due to uh, unregulated hunting, diseases associated with the introduction of domestic sheep and goats, and netwire fencing. Uh, because of all those three things, uh, they brought the demise of, of the desert bighorn, and by the early 1960s, they, they were gone. They were all gone from Texas. The restoration effort has been going on for more than 50 years. Uh, luckily, the population in Texas is now big enough. We're using those sources to transplant animals to Big Bend Ranch State Park. The canyons that we have here, the hilltops will take you away. My name's Rod Treviso. I'm the General Park Superintendent for Big Bend Ranch State Park. We're not crowded, and this is the place to be and enjoy the vastness of this park. It's beautiful here. Every trail that we have out here is so unique in itself. One of the most popular hikes is the Close Canyon. The beauty of that place is amazing from beginning to end. and then mountain bikers, lots of miles. Our trails are well marked. Come enjoy them, the place is waiting for you. When we started talking about the release coming in to release the desert bighorn sheep at Big Bend Ranch, I was all up and thumbs up like, yay, that's great. Why? Because I, we have so much to offer at Big Bend, Big Bend Ranch, we were lacking the one more thing that could be. Another addition now is going to be the bighorn sheep. The morning of the capture, there's a sense of excitement. And once they come upon a herd, they try and capture what we call family units. And that's another measure taken to increase survivability. They fly up and they bank and they come back and they turn around. And it's almost like a like a fast-paced roller coaster ride. It's all, you know, precision work, really all while keeping uh, the, you know, the animal's welfare in mind. We try and rush these things because we try and minimize the stress to the animals. You look up at the mountain and here you see the bubble of the helicopter and then you see the thing attached at the bottom and you know they're sheep. I mean, as they get closer, there they are. When the idea came that they were going to capture in uh, all these uh, the desert bighorn sheep over at the Elephant Mountain, 
I was invited over there by the wildlife guys, and I said, heck yeah, I want to be there. I want to witness it, because I had never seen any of this done. Get the back right here. I just couldn't resist. I felt their horns. Just hug them. right under the arm. They were so rough in a way, and then the animal just breathing right there, his hot hair breathing on my hands. It was just, you know, it's, it's, it's like a rush that you get. You ready? They weigh about, what, 115 something? 15. Yeah. It's just exciting, you know, to see that and feel that animal right there in my hands. I just couldn't believe it. Because normally you see them way up in the mountains. I had them right there in my hands. It was beautiful. Is she good on four or five? Yeah, okay. Once at the processing station, they're aged. You want to take a picture of the teeth? Yeah. You take fecal samples. They also take your blood samples. Uh, take uh, tissue samples. Four plus or four? Four plus. Four plus. And those radio collars are, are there to help us monitor the bigghorns. GPS, 0434. So that's where we get movement and uh, identify other variables such as travel corridors. Are we good? Let's put him in the trail. Now, once the animal is done uh, being processed and he's taken over to the trailer, at that point, he's no longer hobbled. Don't unstrap until we get over. Yeah. So you have to watch it, and it's, it's almost like a, a mini rodeo. <laughs> this is it. As soon as we get those two sheep on the trailer, we're going call it, to call it for the day. From El Fomalantic to the Bofesillos Mountains of uh, Big Bend Ranch State Park, it's roughly about two hours, uh, and that's going at a, you know, 60, 65 miles an hour. We we'll stop once or twice to make sure that everything's fine. And everything's fine. We uh, we keep on we keep on trucking. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> We're the only state park in Texas with the bighorn now. It's amazing. And how fast they move, you know, through the country. So they're right at home. <laughs> this is excellent. It'll be another opportunity, another activity that our visitors can come and enjoy here. Well, that's a good thing. Hopefully we'll get to have all those rams running around and just doing well and multiplying in numbers like we want them to. I'm just very excited to have them here. Come on, big boy. Okay. This is a big deal for state parks. It wasn't a couple of hours ago that they were at Elephant Mountain. Now here they are in their new home. Now they'll be here for, for, for the public to enjoy. And that, to me, is, is wonderful. It's a significant homecoming that's taken over 50 years to make it happen. The bighorns are back where they belong. It's a, you know, it's a wonderful experience. It's my dream come true. And watching them go up the side of the mountain is just icing on the cake. Very impressive seeing those little white rumps just jump, jump, moving so fast. Those animals look so happy to be home, releasing the country that they should be. We're here, we're seeing this, it's happening, you know, right in front of us, their home again. Maybe up here. Jessica Beckham is on a quest. I see all sorts of things flying around. To catch some fuzzy flying insects. No bumblebees though. With great bee expertise. That's a sweat bee. She searches. I think those are so pretty. That's not what I'm trying to catch today. <laughs> the bees that beckon are bumblebees. Today we are out here surveying bumblebees in a little roadside area of Denton County. Uh, that's an American bumblebee right there. Jessica has been studying bumblebees at the University of North Texas while pursuing a PhD in environmental science. Here in Texas, we have sweat bees, digger bees, leaf cutter bees, resin bees. About seven to 800 species of bees that are native bees, including nine species of bumblebees. 
Usually when people think of bees, they think of honeybees, but honeybees are actually non-native species. Honeybee declines have been noted in the news. Back in 2005, we started hearing about a phenomenon called colony collapse disorder. Unusual numbers of honeybees were dying off and nobody understood quite why. In these troubling times for honeybees, Jessica wanted to understand how native bees are doing. I'm studying native pollinators, bumblebees in particular, because native pollinators might serve as an insurance policy against these losses of honeybees. Bees are critical to the food supply. They pollinate cherries, apples, almonds, onions, and many other crops. And they pollinate billions of dollars of crops each year. Insect pollinators in particular are responsible for about 80% of the pollination of wildflowering plants and about 75% of our agricultural plants. Bumblebees are great pollinators because bees deliberately collect pollen and they have a lot more hair than honeybees and they move a lot of pollen from flower to flower. I don't know what they are. I will take about a 15 minute walk through this big patch of flowers to determine what species are here and ultimately look at the persistence of these species in our area. Got another one. Studying bumblebees takes time and some fast reflexes. I feel like I struck out. <laughs> but field work is the fun part, right? <laughs> it's hot. I mean, you, you get chiggers and ticks. Sometimes you see a bee and you don't catch it. <laughs> really though, it's pleasant work for me. Now I got her. This is Bombus pennsylvanicus, which is known as the American bumblebee. This is our most common species here in Texas, but nationally this species is declining. And so the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department has designated this a species of greatest conservation need. You ready to go, girl? Texas Parks and Wildlife has helped fund the research. There you go. In part through sales of conservation license plates. We've received a horned lizard license plate grant as well as a state wildlife grant. To understand Texas bumblebee trends, Jessica compares her surveys with specimens at the Elm Fork Natural Heritage Museum at UNT, where the bumblebee collection spans 60 years. Museum collections provide a rich resource for determining historic presence of lots of different species. The comparisons have been encouraging. What we found is that the current presence of bumblebees here in Northeast Texas is almost identical to the historic presence. About 85% of our roadside sites had at least one bumblebee. Further research has examined bumblebee genetic diversity and the kinds of urban habitats they use. I looked at eight different sites, some community gardens and an organic garden. Are any of them blooming at this point? Some urban wild no. spaces as well. We want to know what types of green spaces are good for bees and also how we can manage our green spaces as we grow cities. The research suggests ways we can help pollinators in public spaces like roadsides and even in our own backyards. You want to try and have flowers that are blooming all the way from about March to October here in Texas because bumblebees are active throughout that time. And you also would do well to avoid the use of pesticides because not only are they effective in killing your pest species, but they also are bad for your pollinator species. Jessica has completed her studies and is Dr. Beckham now, but her work will continue to benefit bee conservation. American bumblebee. As if a sign of gratitude, the hundreds of bees she handled kept their stingers to themselves. I've never been stung by a bumblebee, surprisingly. Since they help our food and flowers grow, maybe we all owe some thanks to the humble bumblebee. Yay for bumblebees. <laughs>
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve.